Okay, class, we're gonna be actually starting week three, if you could if you could believe that. Uh, it's moving along really quick. I hope you guys are keeping up. I know the online uh, format uh, can be a little bit difficult. It's difficult for me. I, I really enjoy teaching in, in person. Uh, but that's okay, we gotta make do with what we have here. So uh, uh, kind of moving right along, uh, just kind of a recap from last week. Um, we talked a little bit about the two different types of domestic violence. Uh, remember that domestic violence is defined in 13700B of the Penal Code, and it has those nine relationships. The spouse, former spouse, cohabitant, former cohabitant, parent of the same child, dating, former dating, engaged, former engaged. Remember that 6211 of the Family Code adds a couple more relationships on top of the nine that I just described. Uh, those relationships include a cohabitant that is non-intimate. It could just be a person that regularly resides in the household. And then also, uh, uh, basically any person related by consanguinity, which is blood, or affinity, which is marriage, within the second degree. So we're talking, uh, you know, fathers, sons, mothers, daughters, brothers, sisters, mother-in-law, those sort of folks, okay? Wife, obviously. Um, but 13700B, those nine intimate relationships are what's gonna define our two, basically domestic violence penal codes. 273.5, which is a felony, and 243E1, which is misdemeanor domestic violence. It's real simple to tell the difference between these two. Felony domestic violence, anytime an abuser commits an injury that's visible, that could be identified by a doctor, or anything that cuts off airway or butt blood flow, like strangulation or suffocation. If those things exist, we have a felony. If it's just a simple push, shove, grab, uh, anything like that that does not leave an injury, but is an assault, uh, it wasn't accidental, it wasn't playing, it was uh, uh, meant to be abusive. A slap, a punch, a kick, a hit, pulling hair, anything like that, and it does not leave an injury, or, you know, uh, like we said, it didn't result in any sort of suffocation, strangulation, or internal injury, then it's a misdemeanor, okay? So make sure you guys understand those two things. Uh, wanna talk today a little bit about um, some of the closely related crimes. Uh, oftentimes we're gonna go to domestic violence uh, calls. Yeah, we may end up making an arrest there for uh, 243.1 misdemeanor domestic violence or felony 273.5 domestic violence. Uh, but oftentimes we're going to find other uh, crimes there. Um, so if you look at your project number three, I have uh, a bunch of stuff there. I have one, two, three, four, five, six codes I wanted you guys to go through. I'm going to go through them briefly, but I really recommend you guys look these up on the internet. Uh, one law uh and fine law are a couple really good sources make sure you use good sources try to stay off like the criminal defense attorneys uh sites because they kind of change it up they're <laughs> they're doing what they can to kind of help their client uh but make sure you're using the actual penal code uh, definition of these crimes the first one you're going to see on there is 422 pc uh, all you guys need to know is criminal threats. Criminal threats is a felony. And basically, it's any time a person makes a threat against another person, um, the, the threat has to do with uh, grave bodily injury. So I have to say something in such a way that puts this person in imminent danger, uh, harm, and fear. They have to have fear. Uh, this is very common in domestic violence. You know, think of the uh, situations where maybe a husband and wife, husband abuser, the husband says, hey, remember what happened last time when you did this or that? And in fact, last time he sent her to the hospital, okay, with, with serious injuries. That is going to be a threat. Uh, make sure we document these in the reports. So criminal threat is a felony. Again, please look it up in the penal code, 422, okay? Um, we want to make sure we understand that. 
646.9, that's going to be the crime of stalking, okay? Stalking uh, actually incorporates criminal threat. So any person who follows a noise harasses and then makes a credible threat. Uh, now these don't have to be to significant others. These could be to any, uh, any sort of person, but we see them often in domestic violence, okay? So again, any person who follows a noise harasses repeatedly, okay? Repeatedly just means more than once, okay? So you, if you just have one incident of it, you may only have a, a criminal threat. But if this person is repeatedly, more than once, followed, annoyed, harassed, and then made a credible threat, we have a felony. Okay, so uh, just kind of a quick scenario. Um, maybe an ex-wife, uh, you know, the husband uh, ended up with custody of the kids or, or something like that. Ex-wife keeps running over to her husband's home, pounding on the door, pounding, pounding, pounding. Hey, come out here. And uh, she does it three days in a row for whatever reason. And then on the third day says, you better open the door or I'm going to kill you. Okay, that would be a stalking charge because she is repeatedly followed, annoyed, harassed, and then ultimately made a credible threat, okay, a criminal threat, all right? So again, make sure you look this up. Uh, I want, uh, these are also, some of these are in the book, so you want to be able to look those up as well. Um, 136.1, that's witness intimidation, witness or victim intimidation. Uh, very common, again, in domestic violence uh, cases. They could happen in, in everyday uh, relationships. But witness intimidation basically occurs when any per person who's a witness or trying to report a crime, a victim of a crime, anything like that, is threatened by another person. Basically, this other person does what they can by threat or by force to keep them from providing testimony or making a police report, okay? So simply just making a, re a police report, if you're trying to make a police report, you're a witness of a crime, obviously. If some person prevents you or dissuades you from doing that, that's a crime. So very common in domestic violence. Probably the most common example is boyfriend, girlfriend uh, in an argument, Boyfriend pushes a girlfriend, knocks her down to the ground, let's say. Girlfriend gets mad, she gets up, she grabs her cell phone, says, I'm calling the cops on you. He grabs a cell phone from her and smashes it into the ground. Or just grabs a cell phone from her and says, you're not calling anybody. That action alone is a felony. Uh, you're preventing or dissuading a witness or a victim from providing testimony or making a police report. Okay? So again, look that section up. Uh, 236 of the Penal Code, this is a false imprisonment section. Uh, could be done in any relationship, but again, we see it quite a bit in domestic violence. Okay, uh, very simple, common uh, version of this in domestic violence relationships. Uh, maybe the boyfriend or girlfriend won't let the other leave the house, but for, for unreasonable uh, causes. Uh, say, you know, in some case, maybe girlfriend's really, really drunk. I mean, really bad. And she's like, well, I'm leaving. She grabs her keys and the boyfriend maybe tries to hold her, keep her from going out in the car. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, you want to, you want to avoid physical contact, but that isn't necessarily an intent to, to stop a person or, or, uh, uh, take away their, their freedom. We're talking about, oh no, you know, honey, I don't want you to leave. And he grabs and he holds her there and he won't let her leave, okay? That could be an example of felony false imprisonment. Make sure you look it up in the book, okay? Uh, 262 of the Penal Code. Um, this is rape, but it's considered spousal rape. Uh, it's all the same uh, elements of, of regular statutory rape. Uh, where uh, penal vaginal in intercourse by force or fear. Okay, where uh, the only difference is they're married. Uh, and they had to include this section because people were claiming uh, basically spousal privilege. So what we want to make sure we understand is doesn't matter. Uh, no means no. You can rape your spouse by force or fear. Uh, it does happen quite a bit, unfortunately, in domestic violence relationships. 
uh, it is a felony and you want to charge it uh, as such. Um, the last one is one I kind of throw in here, but we see it quite a lot, domestic violence situations, is uh, animal cruelty. It's a felony, believe it or not, 597 of the Penal Code. Um, very, very common. Uh, remember, uh, domestic violence is all about power and control. That's what it is. So what better way for a suspect to exert power and control over their victim than to hurt the one thing that they care about and love more than anything in the world. It could be a little dog, a cat. I've seen uh, birds. Um, I've seen uh, s domestic violence abusers uh, kill and maim animals. Uh, just to get back at their victims. So a uh, very sad thing, very terrible thing. We want to make sure we put someone in jail if they do it, okay? So 597 of the Penal Code, basically uh, animal cruelty. Uh, if we commit any physical harm to an animal uh, that's significant, we uh, prevent them from having food and water, things like that, okay? So make sure you guys look those things up and you understand them. Uh, I want you not to just take what I said off this lecture and write it down on your uh, project number three, okay? I want you to actually look these sections up. Give me a little bit more if you can, okay? I want to make sure you guys understand them. Remember that you don't need to know the codes. So if I ask you what 236 is, it's okay for you to go, I don't know, okay? But if I ask you what false imprisonment is, you should know that. If I ask you what spousal rape is, you should know that. Witness intimidation. Okay? You understand? Okay, so uh, I wanted to make sure we got through um, uh, Project 3, more or less. Get your book, guys. If you haven't got it yet, I've given you three weeks to get that. You're going to need that. It's, there's going to be uh, uh, assignments and there'll be stuff on the quiz uh, that relate to the book. Okay? Um, let's see here. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, characteristics of a suspect, a victim, and even the children in a domestic violence relationship. Okay? A lot of people think the suspect is this arrogant narcissist that is so, you know, way up here in his mind. That's not true. Um, they're actually, they have tremendously low self-esteem. Uh, if a domestic violence abuser didn't have low self-esteem, they probably wouldn't be committing domestic violence. That means that they would treat people equally as partner and, and want to uh, work as a team, those sort of things. But it's that power and control that causes them uh, to want to dominate people. Therefore, they have low self-esteem. They don't have a very high opinion of themselves. Obviously, the victim has low self-esteem. Okay. What about the children? Yeah, because they're born into it and they see it. So as far as self-esteem goes, the suspect, the victim, and the children will all suffer from low self-esteem in a domestic violence relationship. Okay. Now, we talk sometimes about post-traumatic stress disorder. It's a very real thing. Uh, a lot of people suffer from it. Cops suffer from it. I suffer from it. We all we all have have been through things. Uh, me on you know over a quarter century doing this job. Uh, I sometimes I close my eyes at night and you know relive some things. So imagine what it's like for our domestic violence victims and the kids. Uh, so PTSD, post traumatic stress syndrome, is a very real thing for our domestic violence victims. It's a very real thing for the kids, the children, in a domestic violence relationship. Um, the only difference is, generally, now we're not saying they don't, but from the relationship, generally suspects do not have post-traumatic stress syndrome. They can from maybe other incidences early on in their life, but they're the cause of it. Okay? They're the cause of the post-traumatic stress syndrome. So um, when, when we talk about post-traumatic stress syndrome in uh, domestic violence relationships, we're generally talking about the effects of the victim and the kids in those relationships, not the suspect. Again, the suspect is, is more or less the primary cause of the PTSD. Okay? Um, I want you guys to remember the definitions in 13700B. 
Uh, remember, 13700B and 6211 of the Family Code have totally different definitions of a cohabitant. For 13700B, what we define 273.5 felony and misdemeanor domestic violence, the cohabitation has to be intimate. There has to be some level of sexual contact, intimacy. For uh, 6211 of the Family Code, Okay, it, it, that isn't necessary. It's uh, the cohabitation could be simply platonic, uh, a person who regularly resides in the household. But remember, the family code section only has to do with things like emergency protective orders, which we'll talk about later, or seizing a deadly weapon or firearm for the residents, which we'll talk about later. Uh, it has nothing to do with the arrestable sections of domestic violence. So make sure you understand that 13700B, the nine relationships, cohabitation is intimate. Okay? Oh, let's see. What about alcohol and drugs? Do you think these are prevalent in domestic violence relationships? For example, the abuser. Yes, they are. And they're so prevalent, in fact. Alcohol and drugs are so often uh, involved with the suspect in domestic violence that we have a mandate to notate whether or not drugs or alcohol were involved. Now, when I was a brand new cop, it was different. Uh, I remember, you know, people telling me, oh, try, you know, don't make a big deal out of the drugs or alcohol because they'll use that as an excuse in court. And in fact, they were actually using it and getting away with it until new laws came into place. And the new law said, yeah, drugs and alcohol are involved in domestic violence and in fact they're they're an objective symptom they're part of it they're an indicia of it so we want to know if drugs or alcohol are involved in a domestic violence incident we want to know about it because that'll be part of the process uh, if and when the suspect is being prosecuted maybe they'll have to go to uh, drug or alcohol classes on top of anger management and any time they may serve as a result of the crime so make sure that you understand drugs and alcohol are often involved with uh, domestic violence, okay? What about, is it only with poor families? No, no, it's involved with all families. You could be rich, you could be a doctor, it just maybe the quality of drugs and alcohol will change. Um, you know, if you're a, a very poor person in a poor neighborhood, you know, maybe your alcohol could be a very cheap beer or a cheap whiskey. Uh, your drug of choice could be a street drug. If you're very rich and wealthy, your, your alcohol could be super high quality label uh, alcohols. Also, the drugs could be prescription drugs. So most often, in many cases, drugs and alcohol are involved in domestic violence and it doesn't matter what socioeconomic level you're at, okay? We want to make sure we understand that. Uh, let's see, lastly, last point I want to talk about is something that's kind of, I know it's sensitive, but oh well. How do we stop domestic violence? Uh, obviously, it's a cultural thing. Uh, again, as I mentioned in the very first lecture, I think the United States does a pretty good job at this in terms of prosecuting domestic violence. The most effective deterrent, put someone in jail, okay? Arrest them. Uh, we, you know, counseling and all that kind of stuff, yeah, that has its place, but it should be subsequent to an arrest. The most effective deterrent to domestic violence is arrest. Put someone in jail. It's going to cause these folks to rethink their relationship. Um, they could get all the counseling and all of that stuff done after the arrest. But you put someone in jail, that is going to deter them. I'm not saying that it's going to solve the entire situation. But if we just went in and said, okay, guys, uh, you know, pinky promise you won't fight again, and we left, that isn't going to solve anything. You start putting people in jail it's going to turn things around and that's actually documented statistically okay so again the most effective deterrent to continued domestic violence abuse is an arrest okay um so i know this was kind of quick but i wanted to give you guys some uh 
uh, information that you will uh, also supplement uh, looking up these penal codes that I gave you in project three uh, making sure you're filling in all the blanks there remember my quiz examples are almost always uh, by uh, what would you call it scenarios okay scenario so you know I may say something like you know uh, Jenny and John are dating uh, uh, Jenny slaps John across the face. John gets mad, says he's going to call the cops. Uh, Jenny says, no, you don't, and grabs his phone and drives off. That's going to be an example of, uh, let's say, felony domestic violence. Uh, witness intimidation. Ding, ding, ding. Okay, Or no crime at all. Well, we can't say felony domestic violence because there's no indication of an injury. Remember, we have to have an injury, something we could see, something a doctor identified, or uh, strangulation or suffocation. That didn't occur in this scenario. If I said misdemeanor, yeah, we could argue that a misdemeanor domestic violence did occur because she slapped him, but that wasn't one of the, the options, okay? So, like I said, you gotta kind of think about that. Um, I give you quiz and test questions very similar to what we give to our, our recruits in the academy. It's very simple. Answer the question. Don't read into it. Okay. Uh, I know a lot of us that are going through college have gone through college. We tend to be critical thinkers. We tend to look way into a question. And that question I just gave you about Jim and Jenny and slap on the face and taking the phone. Uh, you may be thinking, well, wait a minute, what if gargoyles are coming in from the atmosphere and a space clown gets involved? Well, that's not part of the question. So don't read into the questions. Don't put stuff into it that isn't there. Answer the question simply and straightforward, and uh, you'll be very successful uh, with the quizzes and tests, okay? Uh, you are going to get a paper, an essay. Uh, please put some effort into it. The essay is very educational. Um, you guys will get the prompt. Uh, the prompt basically talks about famous people who have been involved in domestic violence. I want you to go out and find some good uh, stories, good articles on these, and write about it. Okay, and you'll see it's it's a very common thing. Um, make sure you're turning your uh, your quizzes in on time, guys. I'm I'm a stickler about that. So if I say your quiz is due at 6 p.m. on Tuesday. If you send it to me at 6.30 p.m. on Tuesday, you're going to get docs and points, okay? And I don't want that to happen. I give you a whole week to do this. I mean, gosh, how much more can you ask for? You get to take a whole week on your quiz. That means you can actually research and, and look stuff up, okay? Um, so anyhow, that's it for now. Uh, I want you guys to put some good effort into your uh, uh, projects. And... Uh, We'll, uh, we'll keep moving along here. Your paper's going to be due in a couple weeks, so uh, put some good work into it, okay? And I'll see you guys at the next session. Thank you.